All right, so as you can see today, uh, we don't have Jan. Uh, Jan is somewhere else having fun. Hi, Jan. Okay. Um, so in today, instead, we have Aaron De Fazio. Uh, he's a research scientist at Facebook, uh, working mostly on optimization. He's been there for the past three years. And before, he was a data scientist at Ambieta and then a student at the Australian National University. Um, so why don't we give a round of applause to the, our speaker today? I will be talking about optimization and if we have time at the end, uh, the death of optimization. So these are the topics I will be covering today. Now optimization uh, is at the heart of machine learning and some of the things I'm going to be talking about today will be used every day uh, in your uh, role potentially as an applied scientist or even as a research scientist or a data scientist. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the application of these methods particularly rather than the theory behind them. Uh, part of the reason for this is that we don't fully understand all of these methods. Uh, so for me to come up here and say this is why it works, I would be oversimplifying things. Um, but what I can tell you is uh, how to use them, how we, we know that they work in certain situations, um, and what the best method may be to use to train your neural network. And uh, to, to uh, introduce you to the topic of optimization, I need to start with the worst method in the world. Uh, gradient descent. And I'll explain in a minute why it's the worst method. Uh, but to begin with, um, we're going to use the most generic uh, formulation of optimization. Now, the problems you're going to be considering will have more structure than this, uh, but it's very use useful notationally to start uh, this way. So we talk about a function f. Now, when we're trying to prove properties uh, of, of our optimizer, we'll assume additional structure on f. Uh, but in practice, the structure in our neural networks essentially obey no of the assumptions, none of the assumptions people make in practice. So I'm just going to start with a generic F. And we'll assume it's continuous uh, and differentiable, uh, even though we're already getting into the realm of incorrect assumptions, since the neural networks most people are using in practice these days are not differentiable. Um, instead, you have a uh, equivalent uh, sub-differential, uh, which you can essentially plug into all these formulas. Uh, and if you cross your fingers, there's no theory to support this, uh, it should work. So the method of gradient descent uh, is shown here. It's an iterative method, so you start at a point k equals zero. And um, at each step, you update your point. And here we're going to use w to represent our current iterate. Uh, iterate being the standard nomenclature for the point. Uh, for your neural network, this W will be some large collection of weights, uh, one weight tensor per layer. Uh, but notationally, we kind of squash the whole thing down to a single vector. And you can imagine just doing that literally by uh, reshaping all your vectors, uh, to, uh, all your tensors to vectors and just concatenating them together. And this method is remarkably simple. All we do is we follow the direction of the negative gradient. And uh, the rationale for this uh, is pretty simple. So let me give you a diagram, and maybe this will help explain uh, exactly why following the negative gradient direction is a good idea. So uh, we don't know enough about our function to do better. This is the, the high-level idea. When we're optimizing a function, we look at the landscape, the optimization landscape, um, locally. So by optimization landscape, I mean the domain of all possible weights of our network. Now, we don't know what's going to happen if we use any particular uh, weights in our neural network. We don't know if it'll be better at the task we're trying to train it to or worse. But what we do know locally is the point that we're currently at and the gradient. And this gradient provides some information about a direction which we can travel in that may improve um, the performance of our network, or in this case, reduce the value of our function we're minimizing. Here, uh, in this setup, this general setup, minimizing a function is uh, essentially training a neural network. So uh, minimizing the loss uh, will give you the best performance on your classification task or whatever you're trying to do. And because we only look at the world locally here, um, this gradient is basically the best information we have. And you can think of this as descending a valley, where you start somewhere horrible, uh, some peaky part of the landscape, the top of the mountain, for instance, and you travel down from there. And at each point, you follow the direction near you that has the most, uh, uh, sorry, the steepest descent. And in fact, the, the method of gradient descent is sometimes called the method of steepest descent. 
And this direction will change as you move in the space. Now, if you move locally by only an infinitesimal amount, um, assuming this uh, smoothness that I mentioned before, which is actually not true in practice, but we'll get to that. Assuming the smoothness, uh, this small step will only change the gradient a small amount. So the direction you're traveling in is at least a good direction when you take small steps. And um, we essentially just follow this path, taking as large a steps as we can, uh, traversing the landscape till we reach the valley at the bottom, which is the minimizer of our function. Now, there's a little bit more we can say um, for some problem classes. And I'm going to use the most simplistic problem class we can, just because uh, it's the only thing that I can really do any mathematics for on uh, one slide. So bear with me. Uh, this class is quadratics. So for a quadratic optimization problem, we actually know quite a bit just based off the gradient. Um, so firstly, a gradient cuts off an entire half of a space. And I'll illustrate this here with this green line. So we're at that point there. Uh, where the line starts near the, uh, the green line, we know the solution cannot be in the rest of the space. This is not true for neural networks, but it's still a generally a good guideline that we want to follow the direction of negative gradient. Uh, there could be better solutions elsewhere in the space, but finding them is, is much harder than just trying to find the best solution near to where we are. So that's what we do. We try and find the best solution near to where we are. You could imagine this being the surface of the Earth, where there are many hills and valleys. And we can't hope to know something about a mountain on the other side of the planet, but we can certainly look for the valley directly beneath the mountain where we currently are. In fact, you can think of these uh, functions here uh, as being represented with these topographic maps. This is the same as topographic maps you use uh, uh, that you may be familiar with from... Um, uh, from the planet Earth, where mountains are shown by these rings. Now, here the rings are representing descent, so this is the bottom of the valley we're showing here, not the top of a hill um, at the centre there. So, yes, our gradient knocks off a whole half of the possible space. Now, it's very reasonable then to go in the direction uh, following this negative gradient because it's kind of orthogonal to this line that cuts off half the space. And you can see that I've got the uh, indication of orthogonality there, the little uh, square. Um, so the properties of gradient descent, uh, gradient descent depend greatly on the structure of the problem. For these quadratic problems, it's actually relatively simple to characterize what will happen. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview here, and I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on this because it's quite interesting, and I'm hoping that those of you with some background in linear algebra uh, can follow this derivation. But we're going to consider a quadratic optimization problem. Now, the problem stated in the gray box uh, at the top. Um, you can see that this is a quadratic where A is a positive definite matrix. We can handle uh, broader classes of quadra quadratics than this potentially, but the analysis is most simple in the positive definite case. Um, and the gradient of that function is very simple, of course. It's AW minus B. And yet the solution of this problem has a closed form in the case of quadratics. It's just inverse of A times B. Now, what we do is we take the step there, shown in the green box, and we just plug it into the distance from solution. So this WK minus 1 minus W star is a distance from solution. So we want to see how this changes over time. And the idea is that if we're moving closer to the solution over time, the method is converging. So we start with that distance from solution, and we plug in um, the value of the update. Now, with a little bit of rearranging, uh, we can pull um, uh, the terms, we can group the terms together, and we can write B as A inverse, uh, sorry, we can pull, uh, what have I done here? Um, we can pull the uh, W star inside the, um, inside the brackets there. And then we get this expression where it's a matrix times the previous distance to the solution. Matrix times previous distance solution. Now, we don't know anything about which directions this quadratic uh, varies most extremely in, but we can just bound this very simply by taking the product of the matrix's norm and the distance to the solution here, this norm at the bottom. So that's the bottom line there. Now, um, when you're considering uh, matrix norms, uh, it's pretty straightforward um, to see that you're going to have an expression where the eigenvalues of this matrix are going to be uh, 1 minus mu gamma or 1 minus L gamma. Now, the way I get this is I just look at what are the extreme eigenvalues of A, which we call them mu and L. And 
by plugging these into the expression, we can see what the extreme eigenvalues will be of this combined matrix I minus gamma A. And you have this absolute value here. Now, you can optimize this and get an optimal learning rate for the quadratics, uh, but that optimal learning rate is not robust in practice. You probably don't want to use that. So um, uh, a simple value you can use is 1 over L. L, L being the uh, largest eigenvalue. And this gives you this convergence rate um, of 1 minus mu L reduction in distance to solution every step. Uh, do we have any questions here? I know it's a little bit dense. Yes? I didn't understand how you got W star. Ah, uh, yes, it's, it's a substitution from in that gray box. Do you see the bottom line on the gray box? Yeah, that's, um, that's just, uh, by definition, we can solve the gradient. So by taking the gradient to zero, if you see in that second line in the box, taking the gradient to zero there, so replace that gradient with zero, and rearranging, you get the closed form solution to the problem here. So uh, the problem with using that closed form solution in practice is we have to invert a matrix. And um, by using gradient descent, we can solve this problem by only doing matrix multiplications instead. Um, not that I would suggest you actually use this technique to solve the matrix. As I mentioned before, it's the worst method in the world. Um, and the convergence rate of this method is controlled by this mu over L quantity. Now, these are standard notations. So we're going from linear algebra, where you talk about the min and max eigenvalue, to the notation typically used in the field of optimization. Mu being uh, smallest eigenvalue, L being largest eigenvalue. And this mu over L is the inverse of the condition number. Condition number being L over mu. Uh, this gives you a uh, broad characterization of how quickly optimization methods will work on this problem. And this, uh, these mu and L terms, they don't exist for neural networks. Uh, only in the very simplest situations uh, do we have L exists, and we essentially never have mu existing. Uh, nevertheless, we want to talk about network networks being uh, poorly conditioned and well conditioned. And poorly conditioned will typically be uh, some approximation to L is very large. And well conditioned, maybe L is very close to 1. So the, the step size we can select in, um, when, when we're training depends very heavily on these constants. So uh, let me give you a little bit of an intuition for step sizes. And this is very important in practice. Uh, I myself find a lot of my time is spent tuning uh, learning rates, and I'm sure you'll be involved in similar procedure. So we have a couple of situations that can occur. Uh, if we use a learning rate that's too low, we'll find that we make steady progress towards the solution. Here we're minimizing a little 1D quadratic. Uh, and by steady progress, I mean that uh, every iteration, the gradient stays in roughly the same direction, and you make similar progress as your process solution. Um, this is slower than it is possible. So what you would ideally want to do is go straight to the solution. For a quadratic, uh, especially a 1D1 like this, that's going to be pretty straightforward. There's going to be an exact uh, step size that will get you all the way to the solution. Um, but more generally, you can't do that. And what you'll typically want to use is actually a step size a bit above um, that optimal. And this is for a number of reasons. It tends to be quicker in practice. Uh, but you have to be very, very careful, because you get divergence. Um, the term divergence means that the iterates will get further away from, from the solution instead of closer. Um, this will typically happen if you use too large a learning rate. Uh, unfortunately for us, uh, we want to use learning rates as large as possible to get as quick learning as possible. So we're always at the edge of divergence. Uh, in fact, it's very rare that you'll see that the gradients uh, follow this nice trajectory uh, where they all uh, point in the same direction until you kind of reach the solution. What almost always happens in practice, especially with gradient descent invariance, is that you observe this zigzagging behavior. Now, we can't actually see zigzagging in million dimensional spaces that we train neural networks in, uh, but it's very evident in these um, uh, 2D plots of a quadratic. So here I'm showing the level sets. Uh, you can see the numbers or the function value indicated there on the level sets. And uh, when we use a learning rate that is uh, good, not optimal, but good, we get pretty close to that blue dot, the solution, after the 10 steps. When we use a learning rate that seems nicer, in that it's not oscillating, it's well behaved, when we use such a learning rate, we actually end up quite a bit further away from the solution. So it's a fact of life that we, ha we have to deal with these learning rates that are uh, stressfully high. It's kind of like... Uh, uh, a race, right? You know, no one wins a, uh, a race by driving 
uh, safely. So our network training should be very comparable to that. Um, so the, the core topic we want to talk about is actually stochastic optimization. Um, and th this is the method that we will be using every day uh, for training neural networks in practice. So stochastic optimization is actually not so different. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to replace the gradient in our gradient descent step with a stochastic approximation to the gradient. Now, in a neural network, uh, we can be a bit more precise here. By stochastic approximation, what we mean is the gradient of the loss for a single data point, single instance, uh, you might want to call it. So I've got that in the notation here, uh, this function uh, 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 L is the loss of one data point. Here the data point is indexed by I. And we would write this typically in the optimization literature as the function Fi. And I'm going to use this notation, but you should imagine Fi as being the loss for a single instance I. And here I'm using a supervised learning setup where we have data points I labels YI. Sorry, data points XI labels YI. Uh, the full loss for a function is shown at the top there. It's the sum of all these Fi's. Now, let me give you a bit more explanation for what we're doing here. We're replacing this uh, full gradient with a stochastic gradient. This is a noisy approximation. And this is how it's often explained in the stochastic optimization setup. So we have this function, the gradient. And in our setup, it, its expected value is equal to the full gradient. So you can think of a stochastic gradient descent step as being a full gradient step in expectation. Now, this is not actually the best way to view it, because there's a lot more going on than that. It's not just gradient descent with noise. So let me give you a little bit more detail. Um, uh, but first, I'll let anybody ask any questions I have here before I move on. Oh, yes? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I could talk a bit more about that. Um, but yes, so you're right. So using your entire data set to calculate a gradient is here what I mean by gradient descent. Uh, we also call that full batch um, gradient descent, just to be clear. Now, in machine learning, we virtually always use mini batches. So um, people may use the, the name gradient descent or something when they're really talking about stochastic gradient descent. And um, what you mentioned is absolutely true. So uh, there are some difficulties with training neural networks using very large batch sizes. And this is understood to some degree. And I'll actually explain that on the very next slide. So let me, let me get to, to your point first. So. Uh, the, the point that uh, answers your question is actually the third point here. Um, the noise in stochastic gradient descent ha uh, induces this phenomena known as annealing. And the diagram directly to the right of it uh, illustrates this phenomena. So neural network training landscapes um, have a bumpy structure to them, where there are lots of uh, small minima that are not good minima uh, that appear on the path to the good minima. So the theory that a lot of people subscribe to is that SGD, in particular the noise induced in the gradient, actually helps the optimizer to jump over these bad minima. And the theory is that these bad minima are quite small in the space, and so they're easy to jump over, where uh, good minima that result in good performance around neural network are larger and harder to skip. So does this answer your question? Yes. Um, so besides that annealing, um, uh, point of view, there's, there's actually a few other reasons. Um, so we have a lot of redundancy in the information we get from each uh, term's gradient. And using stochastic gradient lets us exploit this redundancy. Uh, in a lot of situations, the gradient computed on uh, a few hundred examples is almost as good as a gradient computed on the full data set. And often thousands of times cheaper, depending on your problem. So it's, it's hard to come up with a compelling reason to use gradient descent, given uh, the success of stochastic gradient descent. And this is part of the reason why uh, stochastic gradient descent is one of the best methods we have, but gradient descent is one of the worst. And in fact, uh, at early stages, the correlation is remarkable. The stochastic gradient can be correlated up to a coefficient of 0.999 uh, correlation coefficient to the true gradient at those early steps of optimization. Uh, so I want to briefly talk about a um, something you need to know about. I think Jana's already mentioned this um, briefly, but uh, in practice we don't use individual instances in stochastic gradient descent. Uh, we use mini batches of instances. 
So I'm just uh, using some notation here, uh, but everybody uses different notation for mini batching, so you shouldn't get too attached to the notation. But essentially, um, at every step, you have some batch here. I'm going to call it uh, B. Um, index with i for step, uh, and you uh, basically use the average of the gradients over this mini batch, which is a subset of your data, rather than a single instance or the full um, full batch. Now, almost everybody will use this mini batch selected um, uh, uniformly at random. Uh, some people use with replacement sampling and some people use without with replacement sampling, but the differences uh, are not important for this purposes. Uh, you can use either. And there's a lot of advantages to mini-batching. So um, there's actually some compelling theoretical reasons to not mini-batch, but the practical reasons are overwhelming. Um, part of these practical reasons are computational. Uh, we make, can only utilize our hardware, uh, say, at 1% efficiency when training some of the networks we use if we try and use single instances. And we get the most efficient utilization of the hardware with batch sizes often in the hundreds. Um, if you're training on the typical ImageNet data set, for, in, for instance, uh, you don't want to use batch sizes less than about 64 uh, to get uh, good efficiency. Maybe you can go down to 32. Um, but another uh, important application is distributed training, and this is really becoming a, um, a big thing. So as was mentioned before, uh, people were recently able to train ImageNet a data set that normally takes two days to train, and uh, not so long ago took more than a week to train um, in only one hour. And the way they did that was using very large mini-batches. And along with using large mini-batches, there are some tricks that you need to use uh, to get it to work. Um, I, it's probably not something that you would cover in an introductory lecture, so I encourage you to check out that paper if you're interested. It's uh, ImageNet in one hour. Um, I believe it's Facebook authors. I can't recall the first author at the moment. As a side note, um, there are some situations where you need to do full-batch optimization. Uh, do not use gradient descent in that situation. Uh, I can't emphasize enough, do not use gradient descent ever. Uh, if you have full batch data, uh, by far the most effective method that is kind of plug and play, you don't have to think about it, uh, is known as LBFGS. Uh, it's the accumulation of uh, 50 years of optimization research and it works really well. Um, Torch's implementation is pretty good, but the SciPy implementation calls some Fortran code that was written 15 years ago uh, that is pretty much bulletproof. So um, you can use either of those. So that's a good question. Um, classically, you do need to use the full data set. Now, PyTorch's implementation actually supports using um, mini-batching. Now, this is somewhat of a gray area in that there's really no theory to support the, the use of this. And it may work well for your problem, or it may not. So um, it, it could be worth trying. I, I mean, um, you want to use your whole data set uh, per, for each gradient evaluation. Um, or probably more likely, since it's very rarely you want to do that, probably more likely you're solving some other optimization problem that isn't, uh, isn't training a neural network, but maybe some ancillary problem related, uh, and you need to solve uh, an optimization problem without this uh, data point structure that doesn't sum, isn't a sum of data points. Yeah, I thought there was another question. Yep. Oh, yes. Uh, the question was, uh, uh, Jan recommended we use mini-batches uh, equal to the size of the number of classes we have in our data set. Why is that reasonable? That was the question. Uh, the answer is that we want mini-batches to be representative of the full data set. Uh, and typically, each class is quite distinct from the other classes in its properties. So by choosing a mini-batch that contains, uh, on average, one data, um, one instance from each class, in fact, we can enforce that explicitly, although it's not necessary, um, by having it approximately equal to that size, uh, we can assume it has a, the kind of structure of a full gradient. So you capture a lot of the correlations in the data you'll see with the full gradient. Um, and it's a, it's a good guide, um, especially if you're using training on CPU where you're not constrained uh, too much by hardware efficiency here. On, when training on a, G, on a CPU, uh, batch size is not critical for hardware utilization. Um, it's problem dependent. Um, I would always recommend mini-batching. I, I don't think it's worth trying size one as a starting point. If you're trying to eke out small gains, maybe that's worth exploring. Uh, yes, there was another question. Uh, so in the annealing example, uh, so the question was, uh, why is the uh, lost landscape so wobbly? Um, and this is this is actually something that is very um, uh, a very realistic depiction of actual lost landscapes for neural networks. They're incredibly uh, wobbly. <laughs> um, 
in the sense that they have a lot of hills and valleys. Um, and this is something that is actively researched. Now, what we can say, for instance, is that there is a very large number of uh, good minima and uh, and so hills and valleys. We know this because neural networks have this combinatorial um, aspect to them. You can reparameterize a neural network by shifting all the weights around. And you can get a neural, work, neural network that outputs exactly the same um, output for whatever task you're looking at um, with all these weights moved around. And that corresponds essentially to a different location in parameter space. So given that there's an exponential number of these possible ways of rearranging the weights that get the same network, you're going to end up with this space that's incredibly spiky, exponential number of these spikes. Um, now, the reason why these, these uh, local minima appear, that is something that is still active research. So I'm not sure I can give you a great answer there. Um, but they're definitely observed in practice. And what I can say is they appear to be less of a problem with very... Uh, um, like close to state-of-the-art networks. So these local minima were considered big problems uh, 15 years ago. Uh, but so much at the moment, people essentially never hit them in practice um, when using uh, kind of recommended parameters and things like that. When you use very large batches, you, you can run into these problems. It's not even clear that the, that the poor performance when using large batches is even attributable to these, large minima, uh, to these local minima. So this is, yeah, still ongoing research. Yes, uh, the, the problem is you can't really see this local structure because we're in this million dimensional space. There's not a good way to see it. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, people might have explored that already. I'm not familiar with uh, papers on that, but I bet someone has looked at it. So you might uh, want to Google that. Yeah, so a lot of the advances in uh, neural network design have actually been uh, in reducing this bumpiness in a lot of ways. So this is part of the reason why it's not considered a huge problem anymore when it was, it was considered a big problem uh, in the past. Was there any other questions? Yeah, so the, it's, um, it is hard to see, but um, there are certain things you can do that will make the, uh, the peaks and, and valleys smaller, certainly. Um, and by rescaling some parts of the neural network, um, you can amplify certain directions. The curvature in certain directions can be uh, stretched and squashed. Uh, the particular innovation, uh, residual uh, connections that were mentioned, um, uh, they're very easy to see that they smooth out the, the loss. In fact, you can kind of draw two, a line between two points in the space, and you can see what happens along that line. That's really the best way we have of visualizing million dimensional spaces. So I turn them into one dimension. You can see that it's, that it's much nicer between these two points, whatever two points you choose when using these residual connections. I'll, I'll be talking all about Bachelor Norm later in the, in the lecture. So uh, yeah, if, uh, hopefully I'll answer that question without you having to ask it again, but we'll see. Um, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yes, so LBFGS, uh, excellent method. Um, it's, it's kind of the consternation of optimization researchers that we still use SGD, a method invented in the 60s or earlier. Uh, it's still state of the art. Uh, but there, there has been some innovation. Uh, in fact, only a couple of years later, but there was some innovation since the invention of SGD. Uh, and one of these innovations is uh, momentum. I'll talk about another <laughs> later. So. Momentum uh, is a trick that you should pretty much always be using when you're using stochastic gradient descent. Um, it's worth me going into this in a little bit of detail. Uh, you'll often be tuning the momentum parameter in your network, and it's useful to understand what it's actually doing when you're tuning it. So uh, part of the problem with uh, momentum, it's very misunderstood. And uh, this can be explained by the fact that there's actually three different ways of writing momentum that look completely different but turn out to be equivalent. Um, I'm only going to present two of these ways because the third way is not as well known but is actually, in my opinion, the correct way to view it. <laughs> uh, but I don't want to talk about my research here. So we'll talk about how it's actually implemented in the packages you'll be using. And um, this first form here is what's actually implemented in PyTorch and other software that you'll be using. Here we maintain two variables. Uh, now, you'll see lots of papers using different notation here. Uh, P is the notation used in physics for momentum, and it's very common to use that also as the momentum variable uh, when talking about SGD with momentum. So I'll be following that convention. So instead of having a single iterate, we now have two iterates, uh, P and W. And at every step, we update both. Uh, and this is quite a simple update. So the P update involves uh, adding to the old P, and instead of adding exactly to the old P, we kind of damp the old P. We reduce it by multiplying it by a constant that's less than 1. So reduce the old P, and here I'm using beta hat as the constant there. So that would probably be 0.9 in practice, a small amount of damping. And we add to that the new gradient. So P is kind of this uh, accumulated uh, gradient buffer, you can think of, where uh, 
new gradients come in at full value and past gradients are reduced at each step by a certain factor, usually 0.9, reduced, reduced, reduced. So the buffer tends to be a, some sort of running sum of gradients. And in, basically, we just modify the stochastic gradient step, uh, descent step by using this p instead of the negative gradient, instead of the gradient, sorry, using p instead of the gradient in the update. Uh, so it's a two-line formula. Um, it may be better to understand this by the second form that I put below. Uh, this is equivalent, you've got to map the beta with a small transformation, so it's not exactly the same beta between the two methods, but it's practically the same for, uh, in practice. So uh, these are ver essentially the same up to reparameterization. And uh, this form, I think, is maybe clearer. This form is called the stochastic heavy ball method. And here, our update still includes the gradient, uh, but we're also adding on a uh, multiplied uh, copy of the past direction we traveled in. Now, what does this mean? What are we actually doing here? So it's actually not too difficult to visualize, and I'm going to kind of uh, use a visualization from a uh, Distill uh, publication. You can see the address at the bottom there. Uh, and I disagree with a lot of what they talk about in that document, uh, but I like their visualization, so let's use that. <laughs> um, and I'll explain why I disagree in some regards uh, later. But uh, it's, it's quite simple. So uh, you can think of momentum as the physical process of momentum. Uh, those of you who have done uh, introductory physics courses would have covered this. So momentum is, is uh, um, uh, the property of something to keep moving in the direction that's currently moving in, right? Uh, if you're familiar with Newton's laws. Uh, things want to keep going in the direction they're going in. This is momentum. Um, and when you do this mapping to physics, the gradient is kind of a force that is pushing uh, your iterate, which uh, by this analogy is a heavy ball. It's pushing this heavy ball uh, at each point. So rather than making dramatic uh, changes in the direction we travel at every step, which is shown in that left uh, diagram, instead of making these dramatic changes, uh, we're going to make kind of a bit more modest changes. So when we realize we're going in the wrong direction, uh, we kind of do a U-turn instead of uh, putting the handbrake on and swinging around. Uh, and it, it turns out in a lot of practical problems, this gives you a big improvement. So here you can see you're getting much closer to the solution by the end of it uh, with much less oscillation. And you can see this oscillation. So it's kind of a fact of life. If you're using gradient descent type methods, so here we're talking about momentum on top of gradient descent uh, in the visualization, uh, you're going to get this oscillation. It's just a property of gradient descent, no way to, um, to get rid of it without modifying the method. And momentum to some degree dampens this oscillation. Um, I've got another visualization here which will kind of give you an intuition for how this beta parameter controls things. Now, the beta parameter needs to be greater uh, than zero. If it's equal to zero, you're just doing gradient descent. Um, and it's got to be less than one, otherwise the everything blows up as you, um, uh, you start including past gradients with more and more weight over time. So it's got to be between zero and one. Um, and uh, typical values uh, range from you know small 0.25 up to like 0.99. So in practice, you can get pretty close to one. Uh, and what happens is uh, the smaller values, uh, uh, they result in you changing direction quicker. Okay. So in this diagram, you can see on the left with the small beta, you as soon as you get close to the solution, you kind of change direction pretty rapidly and head towards the solution. Uh, when you use these larger betas, it takes longer for you to make this uh, dramatic turn. You can think of it as a car with a bad turning circle. It takes you quite a long time to get around that corner and head towards the solution. Um, now, this may seem like a bad thing, but actually, in practice, uh, this significantly dampens the os oscillations that you get from gradient descent, and that's uh, the nice property of it. Now, in terms of practice, um, I can give you some pretty clear guidance here. Um, you pretty much always want to use momentum. Uh, it's pretty hard to find problems where it's actually not beneficial to some degree. Now, part of the reason for this is it's just an extra parameter. Now, typically when you take some method and just add more parameters to it, you can usually find some value of that parameter that makes it slightly better. Um, now, that is sometimes the case here, but often these improvements from using momentum are actually quite substantial. And uh, using a momentum value of 0.9 is really a default value used in machine learning quite often. And often, uh, in some situations, 0.99 may be better. So I would recommend trying both values if you have time. Otherwise, just try 0.9. Um, but I have to give a warning. Uh, the way momentum is stated in this expression, if you look at it carefully, uh, when we increase the momentum, uh, we kind of increase the step size. 
Uh, now, it's not the step size of the current gradient. So the current gradient is included in the step with the same strength. But past gradients become included in the step with a higher strength when you increase momentum. Now, uh, when you write momentum in other forms, uh, this becomes a lot more obvious. So this form kind of occludes uh, that. But what you should generally do uh, when you inc uh, change momentum, you want to change it so that you have your step size divided by 1 minus beta is your new step size. So if your old step size was, was using a certain beta, you want to map it through that equation and then map it back to get the, the new step size. Now this may be a very modest change, uh, but if you're going from momentum 0.9 to momentum 0.99, you may need to reduce your learning rate by a factor of 10 approximately. Um, so just be wary of that. You can't expect to keep the same learning rate and change the momentum parameter. It will not work. Now, I want to go into a bit of detail about why momentum works. It's very misunderstood. Um, and the explanation you'll see in that uh, distill post uh, is acceleration. And this is certainly a contributor to the performance of momentum. Now, acceleration is a topic... Uh, uh, yes, have you got a question? Uh, the question was, is there a big difference between using momentum and using a mini batch of two? Um, and there is. So momentum has advantages in, for when using gradient descent as well as stochastic gradient descent. So um, in fact, this acceleration explanation I'm about to use applies both in the stochastic and non-stochastic case. So no matter what batch size you're going to use, uh, uh, the benefits of momentum still are shown. Um, now, it also has benefits in the stochastic case as well, which I'll cover in a slide or two. So the, yeah, the answer is it's quite distinct from batch size, and you sh shouldn't conflate them. Um, learning, like really you should be changing your learning rate when you change your batch size rather than changing momentum. Um, and for very large batch sizes, there's a, a clear relationship between learning rate and batch size. But for small batch sizes, it's, it's not clear. So it's problem dependent. Uh, any other questions before I move on on momentum? Yes. Yes, it's, it's this blow up. So it's actually, uh, in, the, in, the, in the physics interpretation, it's, uh, conservation of momentum would be exactly equal to one. Um, now that's not good because uh, if you're in a world with no friction and you drop a heavy ball somewhere, it's going to keep moving forever. It's not going to stop. So we, we, want, we need some dampening and this is where the physics interpretation breaks down. So you, you do need some dampening now. Now you can imagine if you use a larger value than one, those past gradients uh, get amplified every step. So in fact, the first gradient you evaluate in your network is not relevant information content-wise later in optimization. But if you used a beta larger than one, it would dominate the, um, the step that you're using. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. Any other questions about momentum before we move on? Uh, they are for a particular value of beta, yes. It's strictly equivalent. Um, yeah. It's not very hard to, to, you should be able to do it in like two lines if you try and do the equivalence yourself. Um, Uh, no, the betas are not quite the same, but the, the gamma is the same. That's why I use the same notation for it. Oh, oh yes, so that's what I mentioned. Yeah, so when you change beta, you want to scale your learning rate by learning rate divided by 1 over beta. So uh, in this form, I'm not sure if it appears in this formula. It could be a mistake, but I, th I think I'm okay here. I think it's not in this formula. But yeah, wh um, you definitely, when you change beta, you need to change learning rate as well uh, to keep things balanced. Yeah. Uh, what is the third formulation you were mentioning before? Oh, uh, iterate averaging... Um, form. Uh, it's probably not worth going over, but uh, you can think of it as uh, momentum is basically changing the point that you evaluate the gradient at. Uh, in the standard form, you evaluate the gradient at this W point. Uh, in the iterate averaging form, you take a running average of the points you've been evaluating the gradient at, and you evaluate it at that point. So um, it's basically instead of averaging gradients, you average points. Uh, it's in a sense dual. Uh, yes? Uh, yes, yeah, so acceleration. Um, now, this is something you could spend a whole career studying, um, uh, and it's, it's somewhat poorly understood. Now, if you try and read uh, Nesterov's original work on it, now, Nesterov is uh, kind of the grandfather of uh, modern optimization. Uh, he, practically half the methods we use are named after him to some degree, which is, can be confusing at times. And uh, in the 80s, he came up with this formulation. He didn't write it in this form. He wrote it in a, another form, which people realized a while later could be written in this form. Um, and his analysis is also very opaque uh, and originally written in Russian. Um, <laughs> doesn't help, it doesn't help for understanding. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, all those nice people at the NSA uh, uh, translated all of the Russian literature uh, back then. So, <laughs> so we have uh, access to them. 
And uh, it's actually a very small uh, modification of the momentum step. Uh, but I, I think that small modification belittles what it's actually doing. Uh, it's really not the same method at all. Um, what I can say is with Nesterov's form of momentum, if you very carefully choose these constants, uh, you can get uh, what's known as accelerated convergence. Um, now, this doesn't apply to neural networks, but for convex problems, I won't go into details of convexity, but some of you may know what that means. It's kind of a simple structure. For convex problems, it's a radically uh, improved convergence rate from this acceleration, uh, but only for very carefully chosen constants. And you really can't choose these carefully ahead of time. So you've got to do quite a large search over your parameters, your hyperparameters, sorry, to find the right constants to get that acceleration. Um, what I can say is this actually occurs for quadratics when using regular momentum. Uh, and this has confused a lot of people. So you'll see a lot of people say that momentum is an accelerated method. It's accelerated only for quadratics. Uh, and even then, it's, it's a little bit iffy. I, I would not recommend using it for quadratics. Uh, use conjugate gradients or uh, some new methods that have been developed over the last few years. Um, and it, this is definitely a contributing factor to why momentum works so well in practice. There's definitely some uh, acceleration going on. Um, but this acceleration is uh, hard to uh, realize when you have stochastic gradients. Now, when you look at what makes acceleration work, noise really kills it. And it's, it's hard to believe that it's the main factor contributing to the performance. Um, but it's certainly there, and uh, the, the distill post I mentioned uh, attributes all the performance of momentum to acceleration, but I, w I wouldn't go that quite that far. But it's definitely a contributing factor. Um, but probably a more practical and provable uh, reason why, why uh, noise, sorry, why momentum helps is noise smoothing. Uh, and this is very intuitive. Um, momentum uh, averages gradients, in a sense. We keep this running buffer of gradients that we use as a step um, instead of individual gradients. This is kind of a form of averaging. Um, and it turns out that when you use SGD without momentum, to prove anything at all about it, you actually have to uh, work with the average of all the points you visited. Um, you can get very weak bounds on the last point that you ended up at, but really you've got to work with this average of points. Uh, and this is suboptimal. Like, we never want to actually take this average in practice. It's heavily weighted uh, with points that we visited a long time ago, which may be irrelevant. And in fact, this averaging doesn't work very well in practice for neural networks. It's really only important for convex problems. Uh, but nevertheless, it's necessary to analyze regular SGD. Um, and one of the remarkable facts about momentum is actually this averaging is no longer theoretically necessary. So uh, essentially, momentum adds smoothing during optimization that makes it, makes it so the last point you visit is still a good approximation to the solution. With SGD, really, you want to average a whole bunch of last points you've seen in order to get a good approximation to the solution. Now, let me illustrate that uh, here. So this is, this is a very typical example of what happens when using SGD. Uh, SGD, at the beginning, you make great progress. Uh, the gradient is essentially uh, almost the same as the stochastic gradient. So the first few steps, you make great progress towards the solution. Uh, but then you end up in this ball. Uh, now, recall here that's a valley that we're heading down. So this ball here is kind of the floor of the valley. And you kind of bounce around in this floor. And uh, the most common solution to this is if you reduce your learning rate, you'll bounce around slower. Uh, not exactly a great solution, but it's, it's one way to handle it. Uh, but when you use SGD with momentum, you can kind of smooth out this bouncing around, and you kind of just kind of wheel around. Now, the path is not always going to be this corkscrew tile path. It's actually quite random. You could uh, kind of wobble left and right, but when I seeded it with 42, this is what it spat out, so that's what I'm using here. Um, you typically get this corkscrew. Uh, you get this corkscrewing for this set of parameters. Uh, and yeah, I think this is a good explanation. So some combination of acceleration and noise smoothing is, is why momentum works. Oh, yes, yes. So I should say um, that when we inject noise here, the gradient may not even be uh, the right direction to travel. In fact, it could be in the opposite direction from where you want to go. Uh, and this is why you kind of bounce around in the valley there. Um, so in fact, the gra uh, you can see here that the first step with SUD is practically orthogonal to the level set there. That's because it is such a good step at the beginning. But once you get further down, it can point in pretty much any direction um, vaguely around the solution. Uh, is it? Yeah. Um, so, SGD with momentum is currently state-of-the-art optimization method for a lot of machine learning problems. So, you'll probably be using it in your course. Um, 
for a lot of problems. But there has been some other innovations over the years, uh, and these are particularly useful for poorly conditioned problems. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, some problems uh, have this kind of well-conditioned property that we can't really characterize for neural networks, but we can measure it by the um, test that if SGD works, then it's well-conditioned. If SGD doesn't work, then it, well, it must be poor condi poorly conditioned. So uh, we have other methods we can handle, uh, we can use to handle this in some situations. And uh, these generally are called adaptive methods. Now, you need to be a little bit careful because what are you adapting to? Uh, people in the literature use this nomenclature for adapting learning rates, um, adapting uh, uh, momentum parameters, uh, but in our, our situation we're going to talk about a specific type of adaptivity. Um, and this adaptivity is individual learning rates. Now what do I mean by that? So, in the formulation I already showed you, uh, stochastic gradient descent, I used a global learning rate. By that I mean every single weight in your network is updated using an equation with the same gamma. Now gamma could vary over time steps, so you use ga gamma um, k in the notation, but often you use a fixed gamma for quite a long time. Uh, but for adaptive methods we want to adapt a learning rate for every weight individually, and we want to use information we get from gradients uh, for each weight to adapt this. So this seems like the obvious thing to do, and people have been trying to get this stuff to work for decades, and we've kind of stumbled upon some methods that work and some that don't. Um, but I want to uh, ask for questions here if there's any, any explanation needed. So I can say that it's not entirely clear why you need to do this, right? Um, if your network is well conditioned, you don't need to do this potentially. Uh, but often the networks we use in practice ha uh, have very different structure in different parts of the network. So for instance, the early parts of your convolutional neural network uh, may be very shallow convolutional layers on large images. Later in the network, you're going to be doing uh, convolutions with large numbers of channels on small images. Now these operations are very different, and there's no reason to believe that a learning rate that works well for one would work well for the other. And th this is why adaptive learning rates can be useful. Any questions here? Yes, so uh, unfortunately there's no good definition for neural networks. Uh, we couldn't measure it even if there was a good definition. So I'm going to use it uh, in a vague sense that uh, if SGD doesn't work, then it's poorly conditioned. Um, and yes, so in the, so the quadratic case, if you recall, I, I, we have an explicit definition of this condition number, uh, L over mu. L being maximum eigenvalue, mu being smallest eigenvalue. And um, yeah, the, the larger this gap uh, between larger, uh, larger and smaller eigenvalue, uh, the worse condition it is. Uh, this does not apply for neural networks. That mu does not exist for neural networks. Uh, L still has some information in it, uh, but I wouldn't say it's the determining factor. Um, there's just a lot going on. So th there are some ways that neural networks behave a lot like simple problems, but there are other ways where we just kind of hand wave and say that they're like them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, so for this particular network, this is a network that actually isn't too poorly conditioned already. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a VGD16, which was practically the best, net method, uh, best network we knew how to train before the invention of certain techniques to improve conditioning. So this is almost the best, uh, best condition you can actually get. Um, and there, a lot of the structure of this network is actually defined by this conditioning. Like there, We double the number of channels after certain steps because that seems to result in networks that are well conditioned rather than any, any other reason. Um, but it's certainly what you can say is that weights very late in the network have very large effect on the output. Um, you, that very last layer there with 4,096 weights in it, that's a very small number of weights. This network has millions of weights, I believe. Uh, those 4,096 weights have a very strong effect on the output because they directly dictate that output. Um, and for that reason, you generally want to use smaller learning rates for those. Uh, whereas, yeah, weights early in the network some of them might have a large effect, but especially when you've initialized your network randomly, um, they typically will have a smaller effect of those, those uh, earlier weights. Uh, and this is very hand wavy, and the reason why is because we really don't understand this well enough for me to give you a precise, um, a precise statement here. 100, yeah, 120 million weights in this network, actually. So, um, yeah, so that last layer is like 4096 by 4096 matrix. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, I would recommend only using them when your problem uh, doesn't have a structure that decomposes into a large sum of similar things. Okay. That's a bit of a mouthful, but um, SGD works well when you have 
an objective that is a sum where each term in this sum is, is vaguely comparable. So in machine learning, each sum, uh, term in this sum is a loss of one data point. And these have very similar structures, the individual losses. That's a hand-wavy sense that they have very similar structure because, of course, each data point could be quite different. But um, when your problem doesn't have a large sum uh, as the main part of its structure, then LBFGS would be useful. Uh, that's the general answer. I, I doubt you will make use of it in this course, LBFGS. I doubt it. Uh, but it can be very handy for small networks. Uh, you can experiment around with it with uh, uh, the LeeNet 5 network or something, which I'm sure you, you probably use in this course. You could experiment with LBFGS probably uh, and have some success there. One of the kind of founding techniques uh, in modern neural network training uh, is RMS prop. And I'm going to talk about this here. Now, uh, at some point, kind of the standard practice in the field of optimization, as in research and optimization, kind of diverged with what people were actually doing when training neural networks. And this RMS prop was kind of the fracturing point where we all went off in different directions. And uh, this RMS prop is usually attributed uh, to Jeffrey Hinton's slides, which he then attributes to an unpublished paper from someone else, uh, which is really unsatisfying uh, to be citing someone's slides in a paper. But anyway. Um, it's a method that has some, uh, it has no proof behind why it works, but it's similar to methods that you can prove work, so that's at least something. Um, and it works pretty well in practice, and that's why a lot of people use it. So uh, I want to give you that kind of introduction before what I, I explain what it actually is. Uh, and RMS pop stands for root mean squared propagation. Uh, this was from the era where everything we did with neural networks we called propagation such and such, like backprop, uh, which now we call deep. So it would probably be called RMS deep prop or something if it was invented now. Um, and it's a little bit of a modification. So it's still a two-line algorithm, uh, but a little bit different. So I'm going to go over these terms in some detail because it's important to understand this. Now, we... We keep around this V buffer. Now, this is not a momentum buffer. Okay, so we're using different notation here. V is doing something different. Um, and I'm going to use some notation that, uh, that some people really hate, but I, I think it's convenient. I'm going to write uh, the element-wise square of a vector just by squaring the vector. Uh, this is not really confusing notationally in almost all situations, but it's, uh, it's a nice way to write it. So here I'm writing the gradient squared. I really mean you take every element in that vector, a uh, million element vector or whatever it is, and square each element individually. So this V update is what's known as an exponential moving average. Uh, I just want to have a quick show of hands who's familiar with exponential moving averages. I want to know if I need to talk about it in some more. Seems like it's probably need to explain it in some depth. But an exponential moving average, uh, it's a standard way. Uh, this has been used for many, many decades across many fields for maintaining an average that, of a quantity that may change over time. Okay. So when a quantity is changing over time, uh, we need to put larger weight on newer values uh, because they provide more information. Uh, and one way to do that is uh, downweight old values exponentially. And the, uh, when you do this exponentially, you mean that uh, the weight of an old value from, say, 10 steps ago will have weight alpha to the 10 in your thing. So that's where the exponential comes in, the alpha to the 10. Now, it's, that's not written in the notation. In, in the notation, at each step, we just downweight the pass vector by this alpha constant. And as, if you can imagine in your head, things in that buffer, the V buffer, that are very old, at each step they get downweighted by alpha at every step. And uh, just as before, alpha here is something between 0 and 1. So we can't use uh, values greater than 1 there. So this will damp those old values until they're no longer part of the exponential moving average. So this method keeps an exponential moving average of the second moment. I mean um, non-central second moment. So we do not subtract off the mean here. Uh, it, the PyTorch implementation has a switch where you can tell it to subtract off the mean. Uh, play with that if you like. It'll probably perform very similarly in practice. Uh, there's a paper on that, I'm sure. Um, but the original method does not subtract off the mean there. And we use this second moment to normalize the gradient. And we do this element-wise. So all this notation is element-wise. Um, every element of the gradient is divided through by the square root of the second moment estimate. And you should think of this square root as really being the standard deviation. Uh, even though this is not a central moment, so it's not actually the standard deviation, uh, it's useful to think of it that way. Um, and the, the name, you know, root mean square is kind of uh, alluding to that uh, division by the, the root of the mean of the squares. 
Uh, and the important technical detail here, you have to add epsilon here uh, for the annoying problem that uh, when you divide zero by zero, uh, everything breaks. So you occasionally have zeros in your network. Um, there are some situations where it makes a difference outside of, of when your gradient is zero, um, but you absolutely do need that epsilon in your method. And you'll see this is a recurring theme. All of these um, adaptive methods, basically, you've got to put an epsilon uh, in when you divide something just to, avoiding, uh, to avoid dividing by zero. Uh, and typically, that epsilon will be close to uh, your machine epsilon. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that term, but it's something like 10 to the negative 7, sometimes 10 to the negative 8, something of that order. So really, only has a small effect on the value. Before I talk about why this method works, I want to talk about the, the most recent kind of innovation on top of this method. Uh, and that is the method that we actually use in practice. So RMS prop is sometimes still used, but uh, more often we use a method known as ADAM. Um, and ADAM uh, means adaptive uh, moment estimation. Um, so ADAM is RMS prop with momentum. So I spent 20 minutes telling you why you should use momentum. So I'm going to say, well, you should put it on top of RMS prop as well. Uh, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. Uh, at least half a dozen, and there's papers for each of them. But Adam is the one that caught on. Uh, and the way we do momentum here is we actually convert the momentum update to an exponential moving average as well. Uh, now, this may seem like a, a quantitatively, quantitatively different um, update, like we're doing momentum via moving average. In fact, what we were doing before uh, is essentially equivalent to that. You can work out some constants where you can get a method where you use a moving, exponential moving average momentum that is equivalent to the regular momentum. So don't think of this moving average momentum as being anything different than your previous momentum. Uh, but it has a nice property that you don't need to change the learning rate when you mess with the beta here, uh, which I think is a big improvement. <laughs> So yeah, um, we add momentum of the gradient. Uh, and just as before with RMS prop, we uh, have this exponential moving average of the squared gradient. Uh, on top of that, uh, we basically just plug in this moving average uh, gradient where we had the gradient in the previous update. So it's not too complicated. Um, now, if you actually read the Adam paper, you'll see a whole bunch of additional notation. The algorithm is like 10 lines long instead of three. Uh, and that is because they add something called bias correction. Uh, this is actually not necessary, uh, but it'll help a little bit, so everybody uses it. Um, and all it does is it, it increases the value of these parameters during the early stages of optimization. And the reason you do that is because you initialize this momentum buffer at zero, typically. Now, imagine you initialize it at zero. Then after the first step, we're going to be adding to that a value of 1 minus beta times the gradient. Now, 1 minus beta will typically be 0.1, because we typically use momentum 0.9. So when we do that, our gradient step is actually using a learning rate 10 times smaller, because this momentum buffer has a tenth of a gradient in it. Uh, and that's undesirable. So all the bias correction does is just multiply by 10 uh, the step in those early iterations. And the bias correction formula is just basically the correct way to do that to uh, result in a step that's unbiased. Um, and unbiased here means just the expectation um, of the momentum buffer is the gradient. Uh, so it's nothing too mysterious. Um, don't, yeah, don't think of it as being uh, like a huge addition. Although I, I do think that the Adam paper was the first one to use bias correction in a, a mainstream optimization method. I don't know if they invented it, but it certainly pioneered uh, the bias correction. So these methods work really well in practice. Let me just give you a kind of an empirical comparison here. Now, this quadratic I'm using is, is a diagonal quadratic, so it's a little bit cheating to use a method that works well on diagonal quadratics on a diagonal quadratic, but I'm going to do that anyway. Um, and you can see that the direction they travel uh, is quite an improvement over SGD. So in this simplified problem, SGD kind of goes in the wrong direction at the beginning, uh, where RMS prop basically heads in the right direction. Now the problem is uh, RMS prop uh, suffers from noise just as regular SGD without noise um, suffers. So you get this uh, situation where it kind of bounces around the optimum uh, quite significantly. And just as with SGD with momentum, when we add momentum to Adam, we get the same kind of improvement where we kind of corkscrew or sometimes reverse corkscrew around the solution, uh, that kind of thing. And this gets you to the solution quicker. Uh, and it means that the last point you're currently at is a good estimate of the solution, not a noisy estimate. But it's kind of the best estimate you have. So I would generally recommend using Adam over RMS prop. Um, and it's certainly the case that for some problems, you just can't use SGD. Um, Adam is necessary for training some of the neural networks we use in our language models, say the art language models. Um, it's necessary for training the networks I'm going to talk about uh, near the end of this presentation. Uh, and it's, 
uh, is, is generally the... If I have to recommend something for you, you should use, you should try either SGD with Momentum or Atom as your go-to methods for optimizing neural networks. So there's some practical advice for you. Um, personally, I hate Atom uh, because I'm an optimization researcher uh, and uh, the theory in their paper is wrong. Uh, this has been uh, shown recently. Uh, so the method, in fact, does not converge. Uh, and you can show this on very simple test problems. So one of the most heavily used methods in modern machine learning actually doesn't work in a lot of situations. Uh, this is unsatisfying. And it's on kind of an ongoing research question of the best way to fix this. Uh, I don't think just modifying Atom a little bit to try and fix it is really the best solution. I think it's got some more fundamental problems. Um, but I won't go into any detail for that. Uh, there is a very practical problem I need to talk about, though. Um, Atom is known to sometimes give worse generalization error. Um, I think Jan has talked in detail about generalization error. Uh, do I, should I go over that? So, uh, gen yeah, generalization error is... Uh, the error on data that you didn't train your model on, basically. So neural networks are very heavily over-parameterized, um, and if you train them to give zero uh, loss on the data you trained it on, they won't give zero loss on other data points, uh, data that it's never seen before. Uh, and this uh, generalization error is, is that error. Um, typically, the best thing we can do is minimize the loss on the data we have, uh, but sometimes that's suboptimal. And it turns out when you use Atom, uh, it's quite common on, particularly on image problems, that you get worse generalization error than when you use SGD. And uh, people attribute this to a whole bunch of different things. Uh, it may be finding those bad local minima that I mentioned earlier, the ones that are smaller. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that the better your optimization method, the more likely it is to hit those small local minima because they're closer to where you currently are. And um, kind of it's the goal of an optimization method to find you the closest minima in a sense, uh, these local optimization methods we use. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of other reasons that, that you could attribute to it. Uh, less noise in Atom, perhaps. Um, uh, it could be some structure. Maybe s these methods where you rescale space like this have this fundamental problem where they give worse generalization. We don't really understand this. Um, but it's important to know that this may be a problem uh, in some cases. Uh, it's not to say that it won't give horrible performance. You'll still get a pretty good neural network out of, at the end. Um, and what I can tell you is uh, the language models that we train at Facebook um, use methods like Atom or Atom itself. Um, and they, they give uh, a much better results than if you use SGD. Um, and there's a kind of a small thing that won't affect you at all, uh, I would expect. But with Atom, you have to maintain these three buffers, whereas SGD, you have two buffers of, of parameters. Uh, this doesn't matter except when you're training a model that's like 12 gigabytes and then it really becomes a problem. Um, I don't think you'll encounter that in practice. Uh, and, and tuning is a little bit iffy, so you've got to tune two parameters instead of one. Uh, so yeah, that's practical advice. Use Atom or SGD. Um, but onto something that is also it's also kind of a core thing. That, oh, oh, sorry, you have a question? Yes. Yes, um, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but typically, oh yes, the question. Um, the question was, won't uh, using a small epsilon in the denominator result in blow up? Uh, certainly, uh, if the numerator was equal to roughly one, then dividing through by 10 to the negative seven uh, could be catastrophic. Um, and this, this is a, a, a legitimate question, but typically, um, in order for the, uh, V buffer to have very small values, uh, the gradient also has to have had very small values. You can see that from the way the exponential moving averages are updated. Um, so in fact, it, it's not a, a practical problem. When this, when this V is incredibly small, the momentum is also very small. Um, and when you're dividing small thing by a small thing, you don't get blow up. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, should I uh, run SGD and Atom uh, separately at the same time and just see which one works better? Um, in fact, that is pretty much what we do because we have lots of computers. We just have one computer run SGD, one computer run Atom and see which one works better. Although we, we kind of know for most problems which one is the better choice. Um, for whatever problems you're working with, maybe you can try both. It depends how long it's going to take to train. I'm not um, sure exactly what you're going to be doing in terms of uh, practice in this course. Uh, but yeah, certainly a legitimate way to do it. Um, in fact, some people use SGD at the beginning and then switch to Atom at the end. That's certainly a, a, a good approach. It just makes it more complicated and complexity should be avoided uh, if possible. 
Yes, th this is one of those uh, deep unanswered questions. So the question was, should we uh, run SGD with lots of different initializations and see which one gives the best solution? Won't that uh, help with the bumpiness? Um, this is the case with small neural networks, that you will get different solutions depending on your initialization. Um, now, there's a remarkable property of the kind of large networks we use at the moment, state-of-the-art networks. Um, as long as you use similar random initialization um, in terms of the variance of your initialization, you'll end up practically at similar quality solutions. And this is not well understood. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable that your neural network can train for 300 epochs and you end up with a solution, the test error is like almost exactly the same as what you got with some completely different initialization. We don't understand this. Um, so uh, if you really need to eke out tiny performance gains, you may be able to get a little bit better network by running multiple and picking the best. Um, and it seems the bigger your network and the harder your problem, the less gain you get from doing that. Yes, yeah, so the question was, uh, we have three uh, buffers for each weight. Um, the answer, answer is yes. So um, essentially, yeah, we basically in memory, we have a copy of the same size as our weight data. So our weight will be a whole bunch of tensors in memory. We have a separate whole bunch of tensors that are momentum tensors. And we have a whole bunch of other tensors that are um, the, the um, uh, second moment uh, tensors. So yeah. Um, so normalization layers. Uh, so this is kind of a clever idea. Uh, why, try and sol why try and come up with a better optimization algorithm when we can just come up with a better network? Uh, and th this is the idea. So uh, modern neural networks, typically we modify the network by adding additional layers in between existing layers. And the goal of these layers are to uh, improve the optimization and uh, generalization performance of the network. And uh, the way they do this uh, can happen in a few different ways. But let me give you an example. So we would typically take uh, standard kind of combinations. So as you know, uh, in modern neural networks, we typically alternate uh, linear operations with nonlinear operations. Here I call that activation functions. We alternate them linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. Um, what we can do is we can place these normalization layers uh, either between the linear or the nonlinear um, or uh, before. So in this case, um, uh, we are using, uh, for instance, this is the kind of structure we have in real networks where we have a convolution. Uh, recall that convolutions are linear operations, followed by batch normalization. This is a type of normalization, which I'll detail in a minute, uh, followed by ReLU, which is currently the uh, most popular uh, activation function. Um, and we place this normalization between these existing layers. And what I want to make clear is these normalization layers, uh, they affect the flow of data through. So they modify the data that's flowing through. But they don't change the power of the network in the sense that, that you can set up the weights in the network in some way that it'll still give whatever output you had in an unnormalized network with a normalized network. So normalization layers do not make your network more powerful. Uh, they improve it in other ways. Normally when we add things to a neural network, the goal is to make it more powerful. Um, and yes, this normalization layer can also be uh, after the activation or before the linear, or you know, because this wraps around, we do these in, in order. A lot of them are equivalent. But uh, any questions here? This this bit's uh, yes, yes. Um, so that's certainly true. Uh, but we kind of want that. We want the reload to uh, censor some of the data, but not too much. Um, but it's also not quite accurate because normalization layers can also scale and shift the data. And so it won't necessarily be that. Although certainly at initialization, they do not do that scaling and shift. So it would typically cut off half the data. Uh, and in fact, if you're trying to do a theoretical analysis of this, it's very convenient that it cuts off half the data. Uh, so the, the structure of these normalization layers, they all pretty much do uh, the same kind of operation. And I'm going to use kind of generic notation here. So you should imagine um, that uh, x is an input to the normalization layer and y is an output. Um, and what you do is you do a whitening or normalization uh, operation where you subtract off some estimate of the mean of the data and you divide through by some estimate of the standard deviation. Um, and remember before that I mentioned we want to keep the representational power of the network the same. Uh, what we do to ensure that is we multiply by an alpha and we add a, a sorry, an A, we multiply by an A and we add a B. And this is just so that the layer can still output values over any particular range. If we just always had every layer outputting whitened data, the network couldn't output like a value million or something like that. 
um, it, it wouldn't. Uh, it could only do that, you know, with very in very rare cases because that would be very heavy on the tail of the normal distribution. So this allows our layers to essentially output things that have the same range as before, um, and. Uh, Yes, so normalization layers have parameters, and the network is a little bit more complicated in the sense it has more parameters. Um, it's typically a very small number of parameters, like a rounding error in your count of network parameters, typically. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so the, the complexity of this is I'm being kind of vague about how you compute the mean and standard deviation. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because all the methods compute it in a different way, and I'll detail that in a second. Uh, yes, question? Wait, sorry. Oh, B? Oh, um, it's just a shift parameter. So uh, it, the data could have had a non-zero mean, and we want the layer to be able to produce outputs with a non-zero mean. So if we always just subtract off the mean, it couldn't do that. So it just adds back representational power to the layer. Yeah, so the question is, uh, don't, don't these A and B parameters reverse the normalization? Um, and and in fact, that often is the case, that they, they do something similar. Um, but they move at different time scales. So uh, between steps or between evaluations of your network, the mean and variance can, can shift quite substantially based off the data you're feeding. But these A and B parameters are quite stable. They move slowly um, as you learn them. Um, so uh, because they're more stable, this has beneficial properties. And I'll, I'll describe those a, a little bit later. Um, but what I want to talk about is exactly how you normalize the data. Um, and th this is really the crucial thing. So the earliest of these methods developed was batch norm. And it uses kind of a, a bizarre normalization that I, I think is a horrible idea. Uh, but unfortunately, it works fantastically well. So uh, <laughs> um, it normalizes across batches. So we, we want information about a certain channel. Uh, recall for a, a, a convolutional neural network, a channel is one of these latent images that you have in your network, that partway through the network you have some data. It doesn't really look like an image if you actually look at it, but it's, it's shaped like an image. Anyway, uh, that's a channel. So uh, we want to compute an average over this, um, uh, over this channel, uh, but we only have uh, a small amount of data f that's of what's in this channel, uh, basically height times width if it's, a, if it's an image. And it turns out that's not enough data to get good estimates of these uh, mean and variance parameters. So what batch norm does is it takes a mean and variance estimate across all the instances in your mini-batch. Pretty straightforward, and that's what it divides blue by. Uh, the reason why I don't like this is it is no longer actually stochastic gradient descent if you're using batch normalization, so it breaks all the theory that I work on for a living. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I prefer some other normalization strategies. Uh, in fact, quite a, uh, soon after batch norm, people tried normalizing via every other possible combination of things you could normalize by, uh, and it turns out the three that kind of work are layer, instance, and group norm. And uh, layer norm uh, here in this diagram, you average across uh, all the channels um, and across height and width. Uh, now, uh, this doesn't work on all problems, so I would only recommend it on a problem where you know it already works, and you, that's typically a problem where people are already using it. So look at what the networks people are using, if that's a good idea or not, will depend. Uh, instance normalization is something that's used a lot in modern language models, um, and this uh, you uh, do not average across the batch anymore, which is nice. Um, I won't talk about that in much depth. Uh, really, the one I would rather rather you use in practice is group normalization. So here, um, we average across a group of channels. And this group is, tra is chosen arbitrarily and fixed at the beginning. So typically, we just group things numerically. So channel 0 to 10 would be a group. Channel you know, 10 to uh, 20. Um, making sure you don't overlap, of course. Um, disjoint groups of channels. Uh, and the size of these groups is a parameter that you need to tune, although we always use 32 in practice. Uh, you could tune that. Um, and you just do this because there's not enough information on a single channel, and using all the channels is too much. So you just use something in between. It's, it's uh, really quite a simple idea. Um, and it turns out this group norm often works better than batch norm on a lot of problems. And it, it does mean that my SGD theory that I work on is, is still valid. So I like that. Um, so why does normalization help? Uh, this is a matter of dispute. So in, in fact, in the last few years, several papers have come out on this topic. Uh, unfortunately, the papers do not agree on why it works. Uh, uh, they all have completely separate explanations. But there's some things that are definitely going on. So we can, show, we can say for sure that the network appears to be easier to optimize 
So by that I mean you can use large learning rates. Uh, a better, in a better conditioned network, you can use larger learning rates and therefore get faster convergence. So that does seem to be the case when you use these normalization layers. Another factor, which is a little bit disputed, but I think is reasonably well established, um, you get noise in the data passing through your network when you use normalization. Uh, in batch norm, this noise comes from other instances in the batch. Uh, because it's random what other instances are in your batch, uh, when you compute the mean using those other instances, that mean is noisy. And this noise is then uh, added, or sorry, subtracted from your weights when you do the normalization operation. So this noise is actually uh, potentially helping generalization performance in your network. Now, uh, there has been a lot of papers on injecting noise into networks to help generalization, so it's not such a crazy idea that this noise can be helping. Um, and uh, in terms of a practical consideration, this normalization makes the weight initialization that you use a lot less important. Uh, it used to be kind of a black art to select the initialization in your network. Uh, and the people who had really good models, often it was just because they were really good at tuning their initialization. Uh, and this is just less the case now when we use normalization layers. Uh, and it also gives the benefit of you can kind of tile together um, layers with impunity. So again, it used to be the situation that if you just plug together two possible layers in your network, it probably wouldn't work. Uh, now that we use normalization layers, it probably will work, um, even if it's a horrible idea. Um, and this has spurred a whole uh, field of automated uh, architecture search where they just randomly cobble together blocks and try thousands of them and see what works. And that really wasn't pop uh, possible before because that would typically result in a poorly conditioned network you couldn't train. And with normalization, typically you can train it. Uh, some practical considerations. So, um, the, the batch norm paper, one of the th reasons why it wasn't invented earlier is uh, the kind of non obvious thing that you have to back propagate through the calculation of the mean and standard deviation. If you don't do this, everything blows up. Now, uh, you won't have to do this yourself as it'll be implemented in the implementation that you'll use. Uh, yes, sir. So. I, I do not have the expertise to answer that. Um, I, I feel like it's kind of, sometimes it's just a pet, pet method, like people like layer and instance norm in that field more. Um, and in fact, group norm, if you, it's just the group size, covers both. So I, I would be sure that you could probably get the same performance using group norm with a particular group size chosen carefully. Um, um, yeah, the, the choice of batch norm does affect uh, parallelization. So uh, the implementations in, 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 in your uh, CUDA library or your CPU library are pretty efficient for each of these, uh, but it's complicated when you're spreading your computation across machines um, and you kind of have to synchronize these, these, uh, these things. And batch norm is a bit of a, a pain there because it would mean that you need to uh, compute uh, an average across all machines and aggregate it, whereas if you're using group norm, Every instance is on a different machine. You can just com separately compute the norm. So in all those other three, it's separate normalization for each instance. It doesn't depend on the other instances in the batch. So it's nicer when you're distributing. It turns out when people use batch norm on a cluster, they actually do not sync the statistics across, uh, which makes it even less like SGD and makes me even more annoyed. Um, so. Uh, uh, what was it? Okay. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. Batch norm basically has a lot of uh, momentum, uh, not in the optimization sense, uh, but in the sense of people's minds. So it's very heavily used for that reason. Uh, but I would recommend group norm instead. Uh, and uh, there's kind of like a technical detail with batch norm. Um, you don't want to compute these mean and standard deviations on batches uh, during evaluation time. Uh, by evaluation time, I mean when you actually. Uh, uh, run your network on the test data set or use it in the real world for some application. Uh, it's you, Typically in those situations you don't have batches anymore. Batches are more of a training thing, so you need uh, some uh, substitution. Uh, in that case you can uh, compute uh, an exponential moving average, as we talked about before, an EMA uh, of these mean and standard deviations. Um, you may think to yourself, why don't we use an EMA in the implementation of batch norm? The answer is because it doesn't work. Uh, we, it seems like a very reasonable idea, though, and people have explored that in quite a lot of depth, uh, but it doesn't work. Oh, yes, this is quite crucial. So, uh, yeah, people have tried normalizing things in neural networks before batch norm was invented, but they always made the mistake of not backpropping through the mean and standard deviation. And the reason why they didn't do that is because the math is really tricky, and if you try and implement it yourself, it will probably be wrong. Um, now that we have PyTorch, which, which uh, computes gradients correctly for you in all situations, uh, you can actually do this in practice. Uh, now, I jest a little bit, uh, but only a little bit, because it's surprisingly difficult. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, is there a difference if we apply uh, 
normalization before or after the nonlinearity? Uh, and the answer is there will be a small difference uh, in the performance of your network. Now, I can't tell you which one's better, because it appears that in some situations one works a little bit better, in other situations the other one works better. What I can tell you is the way I drew it here is what's used in the PyTorch implementation of ResNet and most ResNet implementations. So just, it's probably almost as good as you can get. Um, I think they would use the other form if it was better. Uh, and it's certainly problem dependent. This is another one of those things where maybe there's no correct answer of how you should do it, and it's just random which works better. I don't know. Uh, yes. Uh, where, where was I? Yeah. Any other questions on this before I move on to the? Uh, so you need more data to get accurate estimates of the mean and standard deviation. Um, the question was why, why is it uh, a good idea to compute it across multiple channels rather than a single channel? And yes, it is because you just have more data to make a better estimates. But you want to be careful. You don't want to uh, have too much data in that because then you don't get the noise. And recall that the noise is actually useful. So basically, the group size and group norm is just adjusting the amount of noise we have, basically. Uh, the question was, uh, how is this related to group convolutions? Um, this was all pioneered before group convolutions were used. Uh, uh, it, it certainly has some interaction with group convolutions if you use them, um, so you want to be a little bit careful there. Um, I don't know exactly what the correct thing to do is, is in those cases, but I can tell you they definitely use normalization um, in those situations. Probably batch norm more than group norm because of the momentum I mentioned. It's just more popular, uh, batch norm. Yeah, so the question is, uh, do we ever use uh, other instances from the mini batch in group norm, or is it always just a single instance? Uh, we always just use a single instance because uh, there's so many benefits to that. Uh, it's so much simpler in implementation and in theory to do that. Um, maybe you can get some improvement from that. In fact, I bet you there's a paper that does that somewhere, because uh, they've tried every combination of this uh, in practice. Um, I suspect if it worked well, we'd probably be using it, so it probably, probably doesn't work well. Uh, on to the, uh, the death of optimization. <laughs> Um, I wanted to put something a little bit interesting because uh, you've all been sitting through kind of a, a pretty dense lecture. So this is something um, that I've kind of been working on a little bit uh, that I thought you might find interesting. So uh, you might have seen the, the XKCD comic uh, here that I've modified. Um, uh, it's not always this way, is kind of the point I want to make. So, so sometimes we can just barge into a field we know nothing about and improve on how they're currently doing it. Uh, although you have to be a little bit careful. So uh, the problem I want to talk about is one that Jan, I think, mentioned briefly in the first lecture, but I want to go into a bit of detail. Uh, it's MRI reconstruction. Um, now, in the MRI reconstruction problem, uh, we take raw data from an MRI machine, a medical imaging machine. We take raw data from that machine, and we reconstruct an image. And there's some a pipeline, uh, an algorithm in the middle there that produces the image. Um, and the goal basically here is to replace 30 years of research into what algorithm they should use there with, with neural networks, uh, because that's, uh, that's what I'll get paid to do. So, um, and uh, I'll give you a bit of detail. So these MRI machines capture data in what's known as the Fourier domain. Uh, I know a lot of you have done signal processing. Some of you may have no idea what this is. You don't need to understand it for this problem. Or, oh, yeah, yeah so... Uh, a ah. the yes, so you may have seen uh, the, the Fourier domain uh, in one dimensional case. So uh, for neural networks, uh, sorry, for MRI reconstruction, we have two dimensional Fourier domain. Um, the thing you need to know is it's a linear mapping to get from the Fourier domain to image domain. It's just linear, and it's very efficient to do that mapping. Uh, it, it literally takes milliseconds no matter how big your image is on modern computers. So linear and easy to convert back and forth between the two. And the MRI machines actually capture either rows or columns of this Fourier domain uh, as samples. Uh, they call it sample in the literature. So each time that machine uh, computes a sample, which is every few milliseconds, uh, it gets a row column of this image. And this is actually technically a complex valued image, uh, but this does not matter for my uh, discussion of it. So you can imagine it's just uh, a two channel uh, image. If you imagine a real and imaginary channel, just think of them as color channels. Um, the problem we want to do, we want to solve, is accelerating MRI. Um, acceleration here is in the sense of faster. So we want to run the machines quicker and produce identical quality images. And one way we can do that, and the most successful way so far, is by just not capturing all of the columns. We just skip some randomly. Uh, it's useful in practice to also capture some of the middle columns. Uh, it turns out they contain a lot of the information, but outside the middle we just capture randomly. 
Um, and we can't just use our nice linear operation anymore. That diagram on the right is the output of that linear operation I mentioned applied to this data. So it doesn't give useful output. We've got to do something uh, a little bit more intelligent. Uh, any questions on this before I move on? Um, it is uh, frequency and phase uh, dimensions. So in this particular case, uh, I'm not actually sure in this diagram, one of the dimensions is frequency and one is phase, and the value is the magnitude um, of a sine wave with that frequency and phase. So if you add together all the sine waves, uh, weigh them with the frequency, uh, sorry, with the weight in this image, um, you get the original image. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more complicated because it's in two dimensions, uh, and the sine waves, you've got to be a little bit careful, but yeah, it's basically just each pixel is the magnitude of a sine wave. Or if you want to uh, compare to a 1D analogy, um, you'll just have frequencies. So the Pixel intensity is the strength of that frequency. If you have a musical note, say a piano note with a C major as one of the frequencies, that would be one pixel in this image would be the C major frequency. And another might be you know, A minor or something like that. And the magnitude of it is just how hard they press the key on the piano. Um, so yeah, frequency information. Um, yes, so the linear doesn't work. Um, there was one of the biggest breakthroughs in, um, in uh, theoretical mathematics uh, for a long time uh, was the invention of compressed sensing. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of compressed sensing. Uh, hands, show of hands, compressed sensing? Yeah, some of you especially work in uh, the mathematical sciences would be aware of it. Uh, basically, uh, there was this phenomenal theoretical paper that showed that we could actually, in, in theory, get a perfect reconstruction from these subsampled measurements. Um, and we, ha we had some requirements for this to work. The requirements were that we needed to sample randomly. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit weaker. You have to sample incoherently. Um, but in practice, everybody samples randomly, so it's essentially uh, the same thing. Now, here we're randomly sampling columns, but we're, within the columns we do not randomly sample. The reason being is it's not faster in the machine. Uh, the machine can capture one column as quickly as it could co capture half a column, so we just ca capture a whole column. Uh, so that makes it no longer random, so that's one kind of problem with it. Uh, the other problem is kind of the, the assumptions of this compressed sensing theory are violated by the kind of images we want to reconstruct. Um, I sh I'll show you on the right there an example of compressed sensing theory reconstruction. Uh, this was a big step forward from what they could do before. Uh, you, would, you would get something that looked like this previously. That was really considered the best. In fact, some people, would, when this result came out, swore that this was impossible. Uh, but it's, it's actually not. Um, but you need some assumptions, and these assumptions are pretty critical. Um, and I mentioned them there. So you need sparsity of the image. Now, that MRI image is not sparse. By sparse, I mean it has a lot of zero or black pixels. It's clearly not sparse. But it can be represented sparsely uh, or approximately sparsely if you do a wavelet decomposition. Now, I won't go into the details. Uh, there's a little bit of a problem, though. It's only approximately sparse in, when you do that wavelet decomposition. That's why this is not a perfect reconstruction. If it was very sparse in the wavelet domain and perfectly, that would be exactly the same as the left image. Um, and this compressed sensing is uh, based off uh, of the field of optimization. It kind of re revitalized a lot of the techniques people have been using for a long time. Uh, the way you get this reconstruction is you solve a little mini optimization problem. Um, at every step, you, uh, every image you want to reconstruct coming out of the machine. So your machine has to solve an optimization problem for every image. Every time it solves this little uh, quadratic uh, problem with this kind of complicated regularization term. So this is great for optimization. All, all these people who had been uh, getting low-paid jobs at universities, all of a sudden their, uh, their research was trendy and uh, corporations needed their help. So this is great. Uh, but we can do better. So we, instead of solving this minimization problem at every time step, we just use a big neural network. So I'm using B here arbitrarily to represent a huge neural network, B for big, of course. Um, <laughs> and we, uh, we hope that we can learn a neural network of such sufficient complexity that it can essentially solve the optimization problem in one step. It just outputs a solution that's as good as the optimization problem solution. Um, now, this would have been considered impossible 15 years ago. Uh, now, we know better. So it's actually not very difficult. Uh, in fact, we can just take an example of, uh, we can solve a few of these, a few, I mean, like a few uh, hundred thousand of these optimization problems, take the solution and the input, and we can just train a neural network to map from input to solution. Um, that's actually a little bit suboptimal because we can, we can, in some cases, we know a better solution than the solution to the optimization problem. We can gather that by measuring uh, the patient. 
And that's what we actually do in practice. So we don't try and solve the optimization problem. We try and get to an even better solution. Um, and this works really well. So I'll give you a very uh, simple example of this. So uh, this is what you can do much better than the compressed sensory reconstruction using a neural network. Um, and this network involves the tricks I've mentioned. So it's trained using Atom. It uses uh, group norm normalization layers uh, and convolutional neural networks, uh, uh, as you've already been taught. And it uses a, a, a technique known as UNETs, uh, which you may go over later in the course. I'm not sure about that. But it's not a very complicated modification of, of neural networks. Uh, so yeah, this is the kind of thing you can do. And this is, this is very close to practical application. So you'll be seeing these accelerated MRI uh, scans happening in, in uh, clinical practice in only a few years' time. This is not vaporware. Uh, and yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about you uh, uh, talk about today. Optimization and the death of optimization. Uh, thank you.